Papua New Guinea is one of the world's last lawless lands, lying 150 kilometers north of Australia. The town of Leh is the economic capital of the country. Here it more commonly goes by the name Pothole City. It's a sorry sight with its battered roads, its packed minibuses and its extreme levels of poverty. In the streets, uncertainty reigns and the police are ineffective. Trying to keep law and order, the locals call upon private security companies. These guards are not allowed to carry firearms, only bows and arrows. When they do step in, they don't do it delicately. Papua New Guinea has one of the highest crime rates on the planet. In this warehouse, behind high walls, Kevin, a highway driver, carefully checks his truck. In Papua New Guinea, a simple breakdown could have drastic consequences. Well, before each journey, I check that my tires aren't worn out. Because if I ever have to change them due to a puncture, the criminals can use the opportunity to attack me. Bands of looters who want to get their hands on his cargo of pasta, rice and other products. These staples are expensive in Papua New Guinea. Come on, closer, closer. But the bandits haven't a care in the world. Right now, everything is ready. I don't think we'll have any problems. I mean, only if it starts to rain. It's the beginning of the rainy season and the mountain roads can become very tricky. Papua New Guinea is an island half as big as France, but with a road network that practically does not exist. There are just three main roads that are barely tarmac. And yet road transport is vital for the country. Just about everything is imported. The merchandise arrives by the boatload in the port at Leh. The containers have been packed in their hundreds before being loaded onto trucks. Like these vehicles, Kevin is taking his one on one of the most dangerous roads. It's the Highland Highway. The highway is merciless. 700 kilometers long, it crosses wild regions that are unforgiving towards any slack driving. A road that wears out the drivers oh. and destroys their machines. Torrential rains batter the road, washing away whole sections. In the highlands, the fog banks are a trap for drivers. At night, the highway bandits fleece travelers. Off the highway are slopes that are practically impossible to scale. There are not many drivers willing to take on this road. And because of this, companies are ready to pay them handsomely. Kevin earns the equivalent of 1,200 euros a month, four times the wage of a teacher. His employer also houses him with a beautiful house in an enviable district where he lives with his wife and four children. I just see them once a week. I spend the rest of my life on the highway. The rest of my life is spent on the highway. And most of the drivers do their work without ever thinking of their wives. But my husband, he takes care of us. When he's on the road, he calls us regularly to find out how we're doing. When he gets back, he spends time with the kids and he helps me out. So I'm happy. And when he calls, he says it's going well. I thank him. Kevin spends over 60 hours a week behind the wheel. A 
At daybreak, he takes the road towards Kundiawa, a town lost in the middle of the mountains. But his journey gets off to a bad start. We left late. Uh, we should have got going around 3 a.m. The cabin windows are well protected with metal grills. On the highway, this is a must. We put them on to protect against the people who like to throw rocks on the road. Sometimes they hit the windscreen or the side windows. Without this protection, the glass would shatter. No glass. Before taking on the mountain, Kevin buys his fill of betel nuts. The nuts are powerful stimulants. He eats about 50 a day. It's a way of beating tiredness. But it's also a drug that all the drivers are dependent upon. We chew betel to stay awake, and most importantly, to have enough energy to keep on till the end of the road. In Papua New Guinea, the consumption of betel is very ceremonial. See, this is the betel nut here. You get the shell off like this. Next, the chewer uses a bit of a creeper and a small sachet of powdered shellfish. So we take this, and after we mix it with the white powder. And then when we chew it, it goes all red. And that's what helps us keep our eyes open on the highway. It's better than alcohol. Beer. Or beer. Unfortunately, though, a lot of drivers do drink. Alcohol causes terrible accidents along the highway, as witnessed by these rusty carcasses all along the road. But here, when a truck flips over, if it's not a drama, it's an opportunity. Two months ago, there was an accident here. The Young Creek guys came and they smashed in the container with axes and they stole all the cargo. This is an even less cultivated area. Just 50 years ago, the warring tribes lived completely cut off from the rest of the world. It's no easy feat to tow these two containers on this road with its twists and turns and its unfinished side. Kevin does all he can to take care of his engine while the road continues to get worse. The tarmac sections are becoming increasingly infrequent. They're being replaced by battered roads peppered with potholes. Not yet, no, not yet. Oh, what's waiting for us up there is awful. We're really going to be shaken every which way. At 1,500 meters above sea level, it really starts to get difficult. First mountain pass, there's the fog to deal with. Can you see the road? Yes. Yes, well, oh, yeah, well, not really. The mist hides everything the potholes and the other vehicles. On the way down, the fog becomes rain, and the road becomes extremely slippery. Slippery. So I used It's sliding, uh, so I'm forced to use the engine's brake. When they're as wet as this, 
The normal brakes are no good at all. We're in danger of ending up in the river. Just below a ravine several hundred meters deep. With 36 tons pushing him from the back, Kevin must negotiate each bend so he's not carried off the cliff. He's been behind the wheel for eight hours without a break, and he's finding it difficult to remain concentrated. This is a bad sign, a tow truck. Ah, I should ask if there's a problem. What, what's going on up there? Can I get through in my truck? It's muddy. Where are you going? To the Congo. Congo? The way up is slippery. OK, I'll take care. Congo is the name of this place. It's the last stop before Kundiawa, his final destination. When it rains, like today, it turns into an ice rink. The road is poor. Well, not just poor, it's very poor. Rainy days, it's always like this. You can quickly lose control and end up in the scenery. No, no, no. You can't? Yeah. Nope, impossible. The only way to get through, press down on the gas and use the most momentum possible. Unluckily, the truck is overloaded. If I stop now, it'll be hard to get going again. I would have to go back down and begin all over again. Kevin completes the ascent with his foot on the accelerator. We were lucky. Well, for now, it's over. He's just traveled 400 kilometers in 10 hours. We Here we go. Now. We made it to Kundiawa. Destination, the town supermarket. Oh, I'm a bit exhausted, tired. really tired, actually. Tired, but really tired. Yeah. Yeah. His rest will not last long. <laughs> I'm going back home. Right now, I'm going back to, back to my home. I'm waiting till they finish unloading, and then I'll go back where I left from, to lay. Down there, I've got my wife and kids. They'll take care of me, because they know what I have to go through on the road. <laughs> what all have been about the road. Yeah. The driver sets off for 10 more hours of driving, in the opposite direction. In all, he will spend 20 hours behind the wheel of his truck. It's nearly midnight and Kevin comes across an obstruction. A tree is lying in the middle of the road and around it are men armed with machetes. Well, we're just villagers. We're trying to free up the road so that the vehicles can go by. Because after the heavy rains yesterday, this tree fell down. Yeah, if we didn't do this, we'd have to wait for the workers from the provinces. It could take six to eight hours before they got here. Of course, their work deserves remuneration. They are not about to work for free. Certainly we'll ask for money for cleaning the road. The people will pay us, and afterwards they can go by. Kevin is no fool. You know, in my opinion, there are two possibilities. They could have either cut down the tree themselves, or, anyway, it's too dark to check. It's hard to believe that this tree fell down on its own, and once the road is clear, the gang shows its true colors. The racket is underway. Ironically, the tree that they took so much trouble to remove now serves as the toll booth barrier. Here come the police, stay cool, guys. 
Luckily for the road clearers, the policemen don't seem to want to kick up a fuss. We'll go speak to the villagers, and if they ask for money, we'll tell them not to charge too much. Under two euros would be good. If the police are turning a blind eye, it's because, above all, they want to avoid things getting out of hand. Tonight, no one has started in on the passengers, so for them, it's only a minor incident. Yeah, and at the same time, we're not asking for a lot. Only five euros. And we don't rape women like they do in Wabag. The authorities end up by leaving. The extortion continues. After a three-hour wait, it's finally Kevin's turn. I've just got two euros. If they take them, great. If not, I'll sleep here. How much you got? Two euros. Oh, that's good. Hand it over. Kevin is relieved. He won't have to sleep on the road. And he didn't even have to argue. They told me that you can, you can pass through. They told me, you can go through, because we know you. But what they know best is the company for which this driver works. Here, even the bandits avoid scamming the green TNA trucks, an organization known and respected all over the region. The boss is a Frenchman. Gerard Philippe, he's been living in Papua New Guinea for over 20 years and has made his fortune thanks to the highway. Makanim, in the local dialect, this means the lord or the landowner. Here in Kundiawa, all the green shops, about half of all the stores, belong to him. In just a few years, Gerard opened a bakery. And also a butcher's. And then the town's first cafe. Since then, the never-ending ballet of the trucks provides the rhythm of life in Kundiawa. With a road as unreliable as the Highland Highway, it's always a good idea to stock up. Really stock up. Everything depends on road transport. Everything comes down the Highland Highway. If the motorway transport wasn't there, everything would shut down. In the rainy season, when there are landslides, the road can be closed for three days, four days, or as long as a week. We had a huge landslide here two years ago, and the road was shut down for a month. Girard doesn't restrict himself to the small town of Kundiawa. He supplies the entire region and its 300,000 inhabitants. When the businessman walks through the market, he is no longer astonished to find his buns gracing the market stands. <laughs> Gerard's greatest success is his supermarket. Never before has such a thing been seen in this isolated place. The Papua New Guineans have discovered consumer society, and they want more. This is good for Gerard's business, which never gets a moment's rest. So you've got two empty containers at the warehouse, huh? Hey, you, you sleep or you drunk or...? In the back room, young women count the takings of the last few days. Here is what Gerard's seven businesses have brought in. Oh, it could be as much as a million or one and a half million. Ballpark figure. We transport it ourselves in the car. Is there a bit of tension when you do that? Oh, we take security measures ourselves. We change our routine. We don't always do the same thing. Uh, we keep our eyes open. But keeping one's eyes open is often not enough. Oh, we get ready when we go down there. Gerard keeps his semi-automatic pistol on him, loaded and ready to shoot. The destination is the town's only bank. The journey takes only a few minutes. But letting one's guard down is out of the question. Mustn't nod off. You have to keep a good eye out, behind, in front, to the right, to the left, looking at anything suspicious. And off we go. It's the signal. It's necessary to move quickly. The money is put in a safe place as soon as possible. The 
annual TNA turnover is close to 30 million euros. Banks, supermarkets, roads. Papua New Guinea is changing, even in the most remote areas. Here in Gumine, it's a big day. They're celebrating the arrival of drinking water. Ministers, governors, government officials, all have turned out to celebrate the event. Among them is Gerard. After the traditional welcoming ceremony, the crowd heads off to the main square to inaugurate Gumine's very first faucet. Gerard Philippe, we make you feel at home. You're most welcome. Gerard is entitled to all the honors. He even has a place at the tribunal. If you take good care of your coffee plants, you will become rich, because coffee is Gumina's gold and oil. I declare this water supply open. Thank you. has wandered all over the world before making a stop here in the 1990s to become a pilot. For 16 years, he has flown over the country, braving death at the controls of his plane. Come and see this view here. It's extraordinary, isn't it? All these places, I've flown in them everywhere, between all these mountains, every day. You shouldn't tempt fate, though, so I reckon 16 years was enough. I've buried people who didn't quit because it's just a matter of statistics. One day, something is bound to happen. The plane, the only recourse for hundreds of isolated villagers in the jungle. Many pilots have lost their lives here. The dead husks of their machines are scattered about like sinister warnings. The tropical climate is unpredictable. At any moment, the meteorological conditions can deteriorate. But there are always some daredevils willing to take to the skies of Papua New Guinea. Antoine is a young New Zealander and has already notched up over 1,000 hours worth of flying above the country. This morning, however, he's hesitant about leaving. The clouds come down pretty low, and there's a fair bit of rain and low visibility around the place, so um, it just makes it difficult to, to get around, especially when you're in mountainous terrain. So this guy here, the operations manager, he'll make a few phone calls, and we'll make a decision from there on in. Um, we're just waiting for them to call us back at 11 o'clock. If it's still raining, or oh, we don't want to go. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's not a fantastic area to be flying around in bad weather. We've got an HF radio over here, so we can call all the different strips and get a weather report from them. The Papua New Guinean weather forecasting system isn't the best. Do you think you're going to fly on that? Oh, probably. <laughs> as soon as it clears up, Antoine takes his chances. He is transporting rice, biscuits and flour to the people of Kaintiba. It's only 40 minutes flight away, but one of the most difficult places to access. is the clouds that cluster together just above the mountains and hide the landscape. When you're in mountainous valleys like we are today, there could be the chance of a collision. Um, really, that's, that's about the only thing. You've got, to, you've got to respect the weather, you've got to respect the strips. Um, there's nothing to be fearful of. Um, I suppose you could say crashing. You wouldn't want to crash in this country. <laughs> there's good visibility below the clouds. Antoine winds his way through the mountain crests. It's time to land, 
a tiny, far-off strip of land as the Kaintiba runway. It rained in the morning, and the ground is muddy and slippery. At any second, the plane could bite the dust. Tiba, the arrival of a plane, is an important event. So we have no other forms of transport. It's only a plane. We don't have road services for big taxis or buses or whatever to go up and down. This is very remote. Most of the people here have not experienced going on a vehicle yet. They don't know, uh, they have never sat on a seat of a car or bus. There's certainly no hospital here. There's just Sammy, the health worker for the whole region. When we have patients who's injured or emergency... When someone is seriously injured or sick, if it's an emergency and the person might die, we bring them to Kentiba. The only place a plane can land and pick up the patient is here. If the plane is late, the patient will die. The sick person also needs to be able to pay for his or her ticket. It costs nearly 120 euros. Here, most of the locals live with less than 30 euros a year. Antoine only stays for a few minutes. Another community is waiting for him, down below, on another mountain. Back on the highway, just after Kundiawa. The truck must deliver two construction machines to the oil wells of Moro, 300 kilometers further to the west. The road stops there, right in the middle of the jungle. At the wheel is Billy. His cargo is precious, so he never travels alone. Bart in the escort car opens up the way. The road is bad here. Take care. Slowly. On the highway, all the drivers know each other. Another trucker warns Billy via radio that there's a problem further down the road. But, well, the, the road is good, so what blocked road are you talking about? Billy, what are, you, what are they saying? Is the road damaged or not? Yep, they say there are problems in uh, Kalpena. OK, we'll be there in half an hour and we'll, we'll see what happened. Just before Kalpena, there is a police car stopping the trucks. And Billy finds out what's going on. Uh, that section of the road is uh, there's, there's big potholes. It's it's very huge. So for bigger trucks to pass through, they 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 can't make it through because that will cause more problem. In the event the vehicle get off the road, it blocks everything. <laughs> for the moment, Billy's vehicle will have to stay put. Other trucks have already parked near to the small roadside cafe. It's a windfall for the cafe's proprietors. I've got coffee, biscuits, betel nuts, cigarettes. In this place, tucked away in the middle of nowhere, there are not many opportunities to have fun. For the men from the village, it's also an opportunity to make a bit of money by watching over the trucks. There are many thieves in the area. We own this land. This is our home. We keep watch. If they come here to steal, We'll chop them to bits. <laughs> Bart and Billy leave their truck under a careful watch and go to take stock of the state of the road. Hi, hi. Wow, it's going to be a bitch to cross. Look at that. Oh, shit. It's hard enough for the minibuses, but for us, it's impossible. There's a muddy trench in the middle of the road. But turning back without an official order is out of the question. One, two, two, yeah. One, two, two. 
I'm here with the escort car. I have to get to Moro, but the road is blocked. It's difficult to get through. There's a hole and a climb, which is much too slippery. My truck won't make it. Okay, now? Now what do we do? Do we make a U-turn or what? The orders are strict. No U-turn is to be made. They must wait until the road is repaired. The minibuses filled with passengers are too impatient to wait. Only the four-wheel drive vehicles make it through. Non-four-wheel drive vehicles have to rely on the local villagers' strength to get them through. Come on, forward. That's it. Come on, come on, straight. Why are you stopping? It's going to get through. Soon, the minibus's misadventures attract the curiosity of the villagers. And after 30 minutes, it finally makes it. These vehicles are the only method of communal transport in Papua New Guinea. But not everyone enjoys the comfort of the minibuses. In Kundiawa, each afternoon, the pickups are besieged. The mountain dwellers are finished at the market, and now it's time to return to the heights. Hey, clear off! Get out of the way, otherwise it'll run you over. The car is packed, overloaded in fact. However, Paul is getting ready to tackle the highest peak of Papua New Guinea, Mount Wilhelm. The young drivers are scared to come here. They drive on the highway, but up here, never. Up here, no. It's dangerous. But... We need this road to survive. survive so, we just... so we keep using it. Still use that road. He's been making the same journey for over 20 years with his faithful pickup. The gear stick moves on its own, but that's not because of any high tech equipment. The car is the same as the road it's old and battered. Road the road damages the car the holes, the rain, the landslide. The government does nothing. This is a corrupt country, you know, Papua New Guinea. Nobody gives a shit about this road. In the back, the atmosphere is surprisingly good. In any case, the passengers don't really have a choice. It's only the accessible for yeah, us. It's the only way we can make the climb here. We have your market and then we go back up. Even when you're used to it, certain things still surprise you. Come on, you have to push. Come on, push. If they get stuck, the customers have to lend a hand. All right, come on. Climb back in. Get back in, we're leaving. With all the people in the back, Paul is using a lot of petrol. As there are no savings to be made, he prefers to let his old banger freewheel during the descent. When we come down the hill... When we go down the slope, if the brakes loosen or we lose a wheel, the car will become uncontrollable. We could leave the road and end up going over the cliff. Playing the same game, many drivers find themselves at the bottom of the ravine, along with all their passengers. Oops. Now look at that. We'll have to swim for it. 
But this is no pleasure cruise. In the back, it was already uncomfortable, but at least until now, the weather was pleasant. Oh, we have a big rain coming down. At these altitudes, the temperatures fall very quickly. The chill settles in with the rain, which soaks everything. The passengers, along with the road. Happily, the end of the voyage is in sight. Come on, then, get off. The pickup will take three hours to travel just 50 kilometers. On each journey, Paul brings supplies to the little shop in the village of Gambogli. At an altitude of two and a half kilometers, the locals live off the coffee culture. The little money they earn, they spend here on pasta, rice, or cigarettes. Lower down in the valley, we find Billy. While waiting for the road to be repaired, he has parked his truck in the village. Tonight, he'll sleep amongst his family. Hurry up and make something to eat. Billy's here. Have you told the kids to cook or not? No, I told the women. They're returning from the fields and the market. Hurry up, make us some food. Ah, my brother, it's good to see you. I see my wife, I see my brother here. I see my wife, my brother here, uh, my mother, all the family members are here. I feel surrounded. It feels really good. Does it take care of you? Yeah. Very much. Just like now you can see everybody. Yes, yes, they really do. Look, they're in the middle of making me something to eat. Billy will not be the only one to savor the feast. Tonight, all the neighbors are going to benefit from the charity of the driver who has returned to the fold. Are you? Whenever I come back here, I give them some money. I help them financially. Everything they want, I give to them. In order to bring money back home, Billy takes many risks. Tiny, his mother, worries more than the rest. I do worry a lot. When he goes to lay, I stay up and I can't get to sleep. I think about all the rascals, the bandits who might kill him or wound him. I kill him. I think about accidents, about his truck overturning or falling into a ravine. It's only when he calls to tell me that he's arrived safely that I can finally go to sleep. Got all sorts of. There are all sorts of dangers on the road. For example, if one day another driver from the company knocks someone over on the road, it gets risky for me. People accuse me of being responsible. And when they see me, they'll attack me with an axe or a machete, saying, it was you. Even if I explain to them, uh, they'll make me shut up and they'll kill me. In Papua New Guinea, it's really dangerous being a trucker. There's no point in dwelling on the topic. And they prefer to tell stories. Ah, you should have seen this film, mate. An amazing fighter, Rambo, takes his massive machine gun, climbs on the car, and then, boom! Yeah, that's how he shoots. You better believe it. Does the job. Only a few kilometers away, the war is far from fictional. Tribes and clans often fight over women, land, even villages. In Papua New Guinea, tribal wars are traditional. Only today, the fights are a lot bloodier. Before, we fought with spears, bows and arrows. When we were injured, we could pull them out. Now we shoot at each other with pistols. It's a lot more dangerous. Before, it was a kind of a game. Now, far too many people have died. These men have been at war for the past three months. Their camouflage must raise a smile. Uh, but there's nothing funny about their weapons. In the last few days, they've killed a dozen or so people. We've got AR-15, we've got m 16 We've got AR-15s, also M-16s. Homemade weapons, spears, axes and machetes. Axe and boost knives. Hey, it's working well. They exchange the hashish they grow illegally for weapons, often provided by smugglers. When the enemies arrive, I do this. I do like this. <laughs> the rest of the weapons are homemade. 
All this is local handiwork. The pipe is made from a truck tow rope. It has the same diameter as an M16 bullet. We put in the bullet and we close it, like that, with this. We turn it so that the barrel is well blocked. When we shoot, the bullet comes out, but the pipe stays put. <laughs> Looting, rapes, lynching, when these villagers play at being warriors, they are capable of extreme violence. You know, our families can't sleep at night anymore. When the fighting intensifies, the others might come and hunt us out of our village. They burn houses, they massacre people. <laughs> what did he say? And, uh, I want to shoot. He said, uh, <laughs> I want to shoot someone. <laughs> and that person is our cameraman. The guy who made the joke in poor taste is high on drugs. Here, people often mix weapons and narcotics. In these remote areas, drivers are instructed never to stop if they accidentally hit a villager or an animal. Billy takes up his journey once again. And is going full throttle. He's been stuck for three days and must now make up for lost time. Uh, I've got to keep an eye on these two rear view mirrors at all times, just to make sure that there's no problem with the cargo. As soon, however, he's forced to stop once again. The most. Ah, the the yeah, my spine. And yeah, my testicles. I always have to put something underneath, like my towel, to ease them up a bit. And with all these potholes, it shakes hard up and down, and I have to protect them. You know, when the family jewels are bouncing around like that, oof. It hurts. But it's not just the driver who is taking a beating. In the back, the two machines are shaken about more and more. The chain is slipped. Uh, we've got the chain slipped. Uh, we've got in, uh, to check it and tighten it. Tighten it up again. We need to stop and Before take it, a look. Uh, goes to the other side. Step aside, pull aside, and uh, we get this close. It's more serious than expected. One of the machines has already moved dangerously. Its tire has shifted 20 or so centimeters. The machines bounce around constantly and the chain is too small. It can't take the pressure and the machines are too heavy. The chain is broken. Uh, they have to fix it and tighten it properly. Bart and his assistant Paul have to muddle through and tighten the chains as best as they can. Put it in the middle. Oh, that's all it is. After two hours' effort, the two men fall upon a lucky solution. Finish, shall we go? It's done. We can go. Our load is gone. Now our load will move like that. If we go too quickly, it'll fall. That's why we must be sensible and drive very slowly. Just a few kilometers later, they must make another emergency stop. This is the center part now. It's on the center section now. The wheel is once more out of line. And worse, Bart realizes that the other machine has begun to move. One play, look him. You saw at the back? Yeah, it's dangerous. Okay, wait. Pull it. Make sure you check it regularly. Yes, yes, I'll make good use of my mirror. Moro and its petrol wells are not very far off, but at any moment, the load could topple. The chains have got to hold, otherwise we're screwed. It's okay, we'll be arriving soon.
Billy finally reaches the heavily guarded gates of the oil drilling site. That is heavy stuff, mate. You're going to need a bloody big crane to unload all of that. But now, Billy's work is over. I feel better. Oh, I feel better now. Everything is safe. The journey that should have taken three days has ended up taking over a week. Here, it's a long way from the highway and its trucks and the walkers climb down the mountain. In this remote village, everyone is gathering at Gulgame, the most important village in the area. It's the 25th of December, and nobody wants to miss Christmas Mass. Over the past 60 years, Christianity has infiltrated even the most remote areas of Papua New Guinea. Father Matthew is leading proceedings. Merry Christmas, everyone. After three hours of mass, one is allowed to take several liberties with the liturgy. self-respecting Father Christmas, this one has not come empty-handed. Everyone was awaiting his general distribution of lollipops. Father Matthew heads about a dozen churches in the region and several hundred parishes. The mass comes to an end, but for this man of the cloth, there's no time to rest. I'm putting the water to put it in the I must put water in the tank. Yep. He's getting ready for his big tour of the parishes. His main ally in spreading the good word is this old, dilapidated car that he pampers prior to each departure. No one else dares to go adventuring on the slopes that he takes each week. But for his parishioners, the priest braves all the dangers. Well, but, uh, I'm a priest. Right, my friend, I'm a priest. So, as there are people who live on the other side, I must go and see them to give them mass, to take their confessions. My life is devoted to them. I must go. As he carves out his route, hey, brother, I'm off to uh, Guye. Father Matthew is not the type to pass unnoticed. Hey, I'm off my way to Guye. The slope seems impossible, but it's not enough to dissuade this priest, who's an expert in handling the terrain. I love, I love, I love driving on this road. Father Matthew is jubilant. It's almost a sport now, and it's exciting at the same time. We have a cliff, big cliff down there is a big cliff just below. If I miss the road, I wouldn't survive. It would be curtains for me. At the end of my life. Twenty kilometers, and just over an hour later, Father Matthew finally arrives. Hardly anybody ever visits here, so each of the priest's visits is a cause for celebration. Is that your dog? Oh, he's so cute. 
It's part of my personal care to the family. And this is part of my duties towards the families and villagers. I must show them that I am here. If they have the slightest request or complaint or whatever it may be, I must forward it to the authorities so they can do something about it. But it's been a long time since the state has forgotten these remote villages lost in the jungle. In Papua New Guinea, 80% of the population lives below the poverty line. And here, Father Matthew's little white jeep is about the only vehicles the inhabitants will ever see.